Hello, my name is Ren Troy Brown and I'm the producing artistic director and founder of Ebony Repertory Theater. We hope that you would come see our production of Blues in the Night. And if you want to learn more about Blues in the Night and about Ebony Repertory Theater, please watch this conversation with a wonderful Mr. Buell Brown. I first fell in love with the theater as a very, very young child. Uh, all four of my grandparents had been theatricals. My father was a jazz musician and I was greatly influenced by my mother's parents. My mother's mother was born in Los Angeles. Her name was Ruth Gibbons and she was a torch singer and a dancer. And my grandfather, Mr. Lee Young Sr. was a jazz musician. He was a drummer. He was the first black staff musician in the history of Hollywood at Columbia Pictures, 1946. But most notably, he was the drummer and musical director for 25 years with Nat King Cole. He had played, like both my grandmothers and grandfathers, they had played the vaudeville circuit. And so my father was a child actor in film uh, here in Hollywood, and he was a jazz musician. So the arts and the, the, the culture of the theater specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, was always in my life. I was one of six children and I was perhaps the most theatrical of all of my siblings. And so the theater uh, and going to the theater and being aware of the theater and the older performers uh, who were tied to my grandparents' generation, they were always in and around my life. And so that's how the, the real impetus for me, loving the theater and getting in the theater began. I fell in love with acting very specifically uh, while an 11th grader at Hamilton High School in Los Angeles. Uh, we were doing an evening uh, where our, our, our teacher, our drama teacher, Mr. Robert Joukowsky, he gave me a wonderful piece by Paul Lawrence Dunbar to perform. And it was called The Antebellum Sermon. And I had always had a general love for the theater, but that specific love for the theater and wanting to be a professional actor was really, really, really triggered that night, particularly as I performed Paul Lawrence Dunbar's The Antebellum Sermon. Uh, it, I was delivering the work and what the audience was sending back to me, I had never experienced. It was thrilling, uh, it felt cooperative, it felt collaborative, it felt like we were as one. And so as that beautiful energy came back to me, I tried to relax and give everything I could that was honest and truthful back to that audience. And from that moment forward, I said, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life as a professional. Uh, and I'm gonna give myself completely to it. And that's how that happened. Uh, my love as a director, I, I've been directing very recently. I've been really cultivating all the things that I believe a, a director should have over many, many years as a, as a performing artist and going to watch other work and being a student of the work, both of the theater and every other medium where actors perform but I really, really fell in love with doing, frankly, I mean, this piece called Fences, written by a guy named August Wilson. I did it in Denver at the Lone Tree Performing Arts Center. And that just was a tremendous trigger. And it has now uh, gotten my appetite to the degree that I want to do it as often as can, and as consistently as possible. I think the theater experience is particularly unique, first for the actor, because there, you don't hear the word cut in the theater. Uh, you know, you have to go out there and play in these imaginary circumstances with as much honesty uh, and, and as much acuity. You have to listen well in the theater. You have to respond. And the audience is right there. So it's coming back. It really, really, truly is live. And you have to concentrate. You have to focus. It calls on so many senses for you to be a success in the theater and to give an audience uh, what will touch an audience and audiences will invariably send that back to you. So that's kind of an electric moment uh, for the actor. Uh, but as an audience, there's nothing like being transported uh, through a story into the life or the lives of characters, into worlds or universes you've never experienced. But also there are those things that are just immutable and transcendent of the human experience. And when you get touched in a very personal way by watching a play as an audience, you know, like, did they know my life? Were, were the people who wrote this play or directed this play, were they aware of my personal life? That's how magical the theater can be. The process of creating a play as a director for me uh, begins with the initial read of the script and seeing what that play really requires, uh, seeing whether or not I have the stuff within me to navigate what I believe that play requires. Uh, and so that's the first thing. But for me, I think casting is all important. Casting 
is everything to me. Not only if someone is not only right for the role, but you want people who are good in the room, people who are really collaborators. And so I'm always looking for people who are very right, according to my personal vision for the show, but particularly those who will come in the room and be collaborators. I think that's the most important thing uh, of all when you get in there, because when you're truly collaborating and you're open and you're not taking a disposition of, you know, I have a right to get my way in every instance, the theater is about community. It's about companionship and collaboration. It is not at all about competition. The reason Israel Hicks and I created the Ebony Repertory Theater was because there was an, an absolute need, there was a necessity, there was a dearth and a paucity of um, black performing arts, a culturally specific theater company where it was made by the people it represented, it was designed by the people it represented. And it was just, when you talk about the 500 square miles of Los Angeles, it was an important addition in our feeling to the landscape of the theater here in Los Angeles. Uh, we are the first African-American professional theater, meaning actors equity agreement in the history of Los Angeles. And so we saw a major need, we saw a necessity, and we came together with our mutual resources. We got together a kitchen cabinet of five to really help uh, bring our vision to bear. And that was the founding of the Ebony Repertory Theater because a working laboratory and a professional split space where the African-American artists and are the are other artists of the diaspora would have a place to come under the leadership of, of the African-American theatrical community. I first saw a production of Blues in the Night in the early 90s at the Los Angeles Theater Center. We call it LATC. It was under the direction of the man who conceived the show, my beloved friend and colleague, Sheldon Epps. Uh, it was down there with an extraordinary cast of Joanne Jackson, who played the lady from the road. The woman of the world was played by the great Frida Payne. Uh, the, the girl with a date was played by the Tony Award winning actress, Leilani Jones. And the man in the saloon was played by a gentleman who is nearer to me than a brother, Mr. Oba Babatunde. And so it was so wonderful. The, the, the evening was so rich. It was so realized. I was so engaged and entertained. And the play and the evening that is Blues in the Night has never left me. And so when it, there came an opportunity for me to direct this work, I was asked by Karen Desai, the producing artistic director at ICT, if I would come down and direct it. And I said, absolutely, yes. And then as we were finding our, ourselves coming out of the pandemic, desiring a, a first show to present as a part of Ebony Repertory Theater's return, it just made sense that we would continue the production three weeks there at ICT and then four weeks at the Ebony Repertory Theater because I just believe that it's an, a, tr a tremendous opportunity for audiences just to lose themselves and to escape into another time that was rich, that was special, and that navigated uh, the blues in such a way that it touched on the human condition for everybody. And so that's why we decided to bring Blues in the Night to Ebony Repertory theater as its first play after the pandemic. The main story of Blues in the Night, it's set in 1948 in Chicago in a hotel that has seen better days. And there are three women in this hotel. There's the girl with a date, she's young and idealistic and greatly gregarious and she's in search of love. There is the woman of the road from, played by the August Carol Foreman. Uh, the girl with the date is played by Jenna Bird, but Carol Foreman, who is just for me, a gigantic artist and a tremendous human being, she plays a woman from the road. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the woman of the world. And she is in the middle phase of her life. And you know, which, which way do I go with my life? Chaos or community? What's happening? You know, I've had high life, but I'm living in this small hotel room, this ostensibly this efficiency room. And then there's a lady from the road who had been a vaudevillian who has seen it all. And so she's questioning what will become of her life? Raising this question to God, what will become of, of my life? And so they're all there uh, in varying states of ennui, if you will, and they come together to present aspects of their life, lives, their, their careers, and uh, they come together and they have a right to sing the blues. And so that's generally and basically what Blues in the Night is about. There is one man in the show, the man in the saloon. And this man is almost like the Greek chorus. He's just an individual. So let's call him the Greek individual, if you will. He observes the world 
where these women find themselves in this hotel. There is a band uh, that resides in this hotel and he sits in with the band. As a man in the saloon, he, he is a tap dancer in this particular production. He's a singer, but he's an observer most particularly. And he um, uh, observes all three of these women. And we eventually not only hear his observations, but we get a chance to get a little insight into who he is as well. We get a chance to observe him and his behavior. And so that role is played by Paris D. Mann. And it's just so uh, felt and experienced so beautifully. Uh, I've just watched Paris grow in this work and it is such a joy to watch him every single night. I mentioned to you Jenna Bird. I was not familiar with Jenna Bird <laughs> as a young artist in Los Angeles. I was aware that she had done a lot of work around town, but we came to know each other through the audition process. Michael Donovan and, and Richie Ferris, the tremendous casting directors who work for ICT, sent her tape along and she just jumped out. And we said, oh, no, no, we, we got to go with this young lady. I've spoken about uh, the brilliant and August Carol Foreman, but my, I tell you, Vivian Reed is a two-time Tony nominee. She plays the lady from the road. I've known her for many years personally. She's a New York-based actress, but I've known her even since I was 12 years old when she starred in Bubbling Brown Sugar. She was in the first national tour after leaving Broadway at the Pantages Theater. And I went with my grandmother and my mother, and I'll never forget her electric performance in Bubbling Brown Sugar, particularly with the great song, Sweet Georgia Brown and God Bless the Child and other things that she sang majestically in that production. I would love the audience to take away just a sense of the nostalgia at its best, songs and really remember when melodies were really beautiful, when lyrics were wonderful, take you back to a time that was much less chaotic than the time we're experiencing right now. And certainly there were difficulties in 1948. We had just come out of a world war. We were soon to enter into the Korean conflict. There were so many things happening around the world. Uh, the armed forces in this country were desegregated in 48. Um, restrictive housing covenants were struck down in 48. Israel became a state in 1948 and apartheid was signed in the law in 1948. So the world, uh, there was a lot going on, but I hope the audience would take away really the beauty of gorgeous melodies, of having tremendous fun with songs that have a double entendre edge to them. And so just to take away a, a, a sense of their funny bones being tickled and they have a moment, two hours to escape and to go back uh, into some dinner with someone or to gather with friends and talk about a wonderful, easy, fun and uh, hilarious at times, but beautiful night they had in the theater. What I'm personally looking for when I see the performances in Blues in the Night I'm looking for the story to be told in such a way that every single audience member does not have to be confused about what the story is, that these artists investigate their lyrics at a level that is so personal that the story just comes through. And then when you add melody to tremendous storytellers and the movement of Keith Young's beautiful choreography, that's what I'm looking for when those things are executed and it doesn't look like they've been directed. It doesn't look like they've been choreographed, but it looks like it's almost improvisatory, that it's happening right in the moment. And that's what I look for when that spontaneity is there and that electricity is there. Uh, and then the audience can take a beautiful, beautiful journey. I feel very strongly that people should come see our production of Blues in the Night at the Nate Holden Performing Arts Center because you really have four artists uh, holding a standard that you just don't see every day. You just don't see the standard of Paris Mann, Jenna Bird, Carol Foreman, and Vivian Reed. And they are giving themselves so completely to this work. The musicians, our musical director, William Foster McDaniel, and all of the musicians, Dell Atkins on bass, Clayton Cameron on drums, Scott Mayo on woodwinds, and Fernando Pullum on trumpet, the collective company, they give themselves so beautifully to the work, and they all have so many years of doing this work at a high standard. And when it comes together, in the form of the presentation of Blues in the Night, it is absolutely worth the drive and the cost and everything associated with getting to the theater, in my feeling. Voices of all kinds absolutely have the right and deserve to be heard in the theater. Every single community imaginable, because every community has a storyteller. These are stories, the stories of people's lives, the stories of people's experience. And so 
the theater should not be some sort of narrow elite enterprise where only one or two groups get a chance to tell their story. But I do believe very, very strongly that each people should tell its own story, but it should be diverse, it should be far reaching and wide, and it should not be narrow. The theater, with all that it's done historically, has often, particularly in this country, been very narrow. The time has come in no uncertain terms for the stages to be populated by people of every stripe telling their own stories. I would tell other actors and theater creatives um, who are interested in working in the theater, I would, I would desire for them to align themselves with the Ebony Repertory Theater uh, because we, meaning those of us who are in leadership there, uh, myself, I'm the producing artistic director, but our managing director is one of the most brilliant human beings and one of the kindest uh, human beings I've ever known in my life. Her name is Gail Hooks. And so working with the Ebony Repertory Theater, we place a premium on treating people with tremendous respect, with tremendous sensitivity, uh, and there is a welcome embrace, and we want the environment to be safe. We want all people there to feel protected. And we have a diverse group of personalities working with us, uh, and we always have from our very beginning. And it's a place uh, where it's kind of, we like to promote it as a kind of theatrical sanctuary. You know, that's what it is. It's a working laboratory that promotes respect, that, re that promotes inclusion and promotes real companionship again and collaboration, not at all competition and not dealing in with people in harsh uh, and untoward ways, but really respecting every single person who walks through the door. So I would hope that theater professionals would wanna work with Ebony Repertory Theater and align with us because of those principles. We at Ebony Repertory Theater believe our presence is very important. We believe that we provide a service to the city of Los Angeles and our larger community uh, because we, again, we want to respect our audiences. We want to deliver a high standard of performing arts and we want people to be able to come into our theater chamber, uh, what I would, you know, my beloved Oba Babatunde calls our jewel box and to be able to see themselves reflected on stage and to, you know, to see themselves as whole and to be able to leave that theater chamber feeling better about who you are and what you are. So that is one of the great important reasons why I believe Ebony Repertory Theater should be supported. Not that it's going to line the pockets of Ren Troy Brown or Gail Hooks or anyone who works with us particularly. We need to earn and certainly we need to be able to stay there to keep our doors open and, and earn from that perspective. But supporting this, when you support Ebony Repertory Theater, you support an entire community because our goal is to have people come in there and leave better by seeing themselves as a whole human being. And so I think that's the greatest worth uh, of anyone who's considering supporting Ebony Repertory Theater. My name is Ren Troy Brown, and I'm the producing artistic director of Ebony Repertory Theater. Our present production on until December 5th is Blues in the Night, conceived by Sheldon Epps, starring Jenna Bird, Carol Foreman, Paris D. Mann, and Vivian Reed. We're at the Nate Holden Performing Arts Center, 4718 West Washington Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90016. And our website is www.ebonyrep.org. Come see the work of all these extraordinary artists, all these extraordinary designers in Blues in the Night at the Nate Holden Performing Arts Center until Sunday, December 5th.